What's going on, everyone? Today, we're welcoming in a man who's been in the upper echelon of the UFC lightweight division, currently sitting at number 10 in the world. He is the definition of anytime, any place, anywhere, not just in the octagon, but also as a commentator. It's Paul Felder. Paul, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, thanks for having me, man. I'm glad I can uh, help out in any way, um, especially for anybody that wants to be involved in sports journalism and broadcasting. Um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a crazy fun job. And as you know, and anybody knows that's trying to get involved in this, there's a lot more work involved than people realize. I think it's not just watching sports or commentating on sports and having a good time. You know, there's yeah. a lot of uh, research and and you got to be able to speak on camera. You got to be able to talk. You got to be able to write on, you know, articles and things like that. So it's a tough, it's a tough path. It definitely is. And we will dive into your uh, commentary with the UFC a little bit later on. Uh, but the first thing I wanted to ask you is, how are you? Uh, I know that you just recently got done with your quarantine uh, after you got back from Abu Dhabi from this most recent Flight Island card. Uh, so one of the first things I wanted to ask was you've been an outlier from the majority of the population since COVID started because you've actually been able to travel inside and outside of the United States. Uh, for the people that don't really know because they haven't had the opportunity to travel, what is the safety protocol like for you? What are the quarantines like for you when you get back into the States? And does it even feel nice to travel at all since the pandemic started? Yeah, well, as far as it's not fun to travel. It's not like it used to be, um, especially, you know, when I work for the UFC, especially now when I travel anything over three hours, it's, it's first class or business class. So that used to, when I first got that, uh, when I booked this job as a commentator for the UFC, I was like, Oh man, you know, <laughs> sitting in uh, first class seats, sitting in business class, getting champagne. There's people everywhere. You feel like a boss. Now it, it's not like that. It's, even in first class, you're getting like a, you know, a wrapped sandwich, if anything, and you're, you're worried about everybody next to you. You're constantly wearing masks. I'm washing my hands like crazy. And then the quarantines in Vegas. So if the fight's in Vegas, we have to get there, you know, usually a couple nights before. Usually we got there a lot earlier to these sites um, to kind of do fighter meetings in person, to have format meetings in person. Now all of that's kind of virtual. We'll do it just like this. We'll have the fighters in a room at the location do a Zoom call with them, next person comes out, comes back in, and we're all doing them from our homes, whether it be in Vegas, here in Philly, some guys in Colorado, John Anik lives in Florida. But then when we get there, we gotta get tested right away, immediately have to do a 24 hour quarantine before the fight, get tested again usually to get entrance into the arena, wherever it be, and then obviously I'm out of there if it's Vegas the next day. Same thing, back with the masks, back on travel the airport's kind of a a nerve-wracking place because i'm not worried about getting it once i get into my little bubble in vegas or in fight island it's in the airports that i'm worried about right you know really get anything and as far as abu dhabi that's in, in a whole nother ball game where we got to go to vegas first quarantine in vegas pass that COVID test get on the flight it's a chartered flight for Etihad airlines and it's just us. It's just UFC staff, employees, fighters. We fly to Abu Dhabi and everybody on that flight has been COVID tested. Then when we get there, we have to do a 48 hour quarantine. So we test the first day. They bring you the results. You go back down if you pass, test again, go back up to your room, wait 24 hours. Then you're released. Then you have to test before weigh-ins for every show. Because we're usually working anywhere from two to five shows on that island when we're there. Right worth our time so that's kind of how it's been with travel and um but the the island is nice once we're there it's kind of you almost feel like you're back to a little bit of normalcy because you're around people we're allowed to hang out with each other because we've all been tested several times we still have to wear masks we're social distancing is still kind of emphasized but you know it's there's bars we get to have a drink together only four people at a table but you get a little snippet of what life used to be. It's better than what it is in the States currently, for yeah. sure. And it's so interesting because in the buildup for Usman Masvidal, right, the amount of testing that Masvidal had to go through uh, before he could even be cleared to fight or weigh in, right? And then you, on top of that, had to include the brutal weight cut that he had to go through, right? You went through something relatively similar for your fight with Rafael Dos Anjos, right? Yeah. So was that testing period and that quarantine period, even before your weight cut, 
I mean, what was that like for you? Because it's not like you could necessarily go out to a gym and, you know, really, really cut weight. You had to make sure that you were quarantined and staying safe. Yeah. So for me, it was a little different for me than it was for Masvidal, only because he had to go to Abu Dhabi, right? At least my fight was in Vegas. And so that was a little more, you know, smoother of a transition for me. So I got there, did the testing, quarantine. And luckily, since I took the fight on such short notice, the UFC offered me the um, the PIs, uh, sauna and hot tub, and I was the only one allowed to use it. So normally I'd have been doing that weight cut in our room with one of those portable little saunas where the, your head sticks out. Mm-hmm. And listen, I wasn't going to be able to cut the amount of weight that I had to cut in that amount of time in that thing. It just wasn't, that wasn't going to happen. So luckily I had the sauna, which gets up to like, you know, the high one eighties and then the hot tub. And I was just doing that back and forth. And um, yeah, it was absolutely miserable, Mis- a miserable few days, the hardest weight cut I've ever had, but uh, definitely the, the best, craziest, most bonding experience I've had with coaches and teammates. Um, we were like a band of brothers that came together. I had Dan Ige, who's a UFC fighter, who's part of the same management company. My manager, Brian Butler, Eric Nixick, and of course, head coach, Duke Rufus, and my man, Ian Larios, my nutritionist. I mean, we all just kind of figured it out and got it done. And it was um, it was pretty epic. So New York and Massachusetts are two states uh, beginning the process of allowing limited fans into arenas starting either late February or early March. Uh, you had the opportunity in Abu Dhabi to be cage side for UFC 257. Uh, where there were limited fans in attendance. And yeah. in fact, 257 was almost exactly a year from your fight with Dan Hooker, uh, which was one of the last fights that saw fans in the arenas before the pandemic started. So I know that you weren't in the octagon fighting, but how did it feel to actually see and hear some fans for the first time in what feels like forever? Man, so refreshing. Um, I know it's tough. I know it's hard for us to do over here, but the difference between having no crowd and even having that limited crowd was night and day. I mean, as soon as we walked, first of all, we're in a stadium again, right? The Etihad Stadium. Right. So I'm walking through the tunnel again, even as a commentator though, it's the same thing. And you walk out and there's crowds and they're yelling at DC, they're yelling at Anik and me. So you you already have that, that, that you know, excited, nervous energy that you that I normally got during a broadcast. But then when you put it in the apex, it's home, you know, it's basically a set for us. Right. Um, once the fights are on, it's amazing. But to walk out there with a few thousand people in the stadium, especially for Poirier McGregor, that was incredible to hear. I was taking my headphones on my headset off, listening to the crowd again. And just having that kind of energy coming back down at you, even as a broadcaster, it's, it's so much better. It was so much fun to have them there, to hear them, to hear them doing the, the Ric Flair woo, to hear them doing all the dumb <laughs> stuff that they do, yelling at the girls, fighting, just inappropriate stuff. That was the only thing I was like, that's the one thing I don't miss is them yelling stupid things at fighters. Drives me crazy. These guys that couldn't brush the Doritos off of their chest are yelling at these world-class athletes. But I'll still take that over no problem. Definitely. And I, I have to ask, because I've always wondered when I've been watching on TV, uh, as a fighter and as a commentator, what was the adjustment period like being able to literally hear everything right between the corners, the fight chatter between the two athletes competing, right? What was that like for you in terms of adjustment? And is it still weird now that you've actually been able to hear and see a crowd again? So that's the one thing that made it fun, right? So during the the height of the pandemic, when we had nothing going on, I think we got excited about hearing the corners, hearing the trash talk between fighters and them being able to hear us. We were having a little fun with it, but let's be honest, that was just us finding something to kind of latch on to, to get us past this time when we had no crowd. Once that crowd came back, I'm like, I don't care about hearing the corners. I don't care about hearing the trash talk. I want that energy for myself and for the fighters. You could just, you can tell that that, that silence is, is eerie at some point. Yeah. Um, especially during finishes, like when a guy gets really like Frankie Edgar and Corey Sandhagen. I was going to say Sandhagen, Edgar. Yeah. It's not fun, man. It, it, it makes you also realize just how 
kind of brutal this sport can be even boxing right when you when there's no crowd and these guys get laid out on the canvas and you hear them i mean literally face plant into that floor it's right it's uh it's a i i don't want that you know i want a little bit of cushion and that crowd provides that um you know either way these we're, we know what we're in for as fighters when we're in there but it's certainly you know it kind of makes it a little bit harder to watch i think sometimes without that 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 buffer yeah definitely and and you think about the possibility of a Francis Ngannou, Stipe Miocic fight this spring, and you think about the amount of, of noise that can make. I mean, Francis Ngannou sounds like he's swinging a baseball bat when he hits you with a crowd, right? So yeah. it's, yeah, it's ridiculous when you have the opportunity to have two heavyweights step in there with no crowds. And correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, Ngannou, Jarzinho, Rosenstruck was uh, in front of no, no fans, wow. right? That was in the apex. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I've, I've been in the octagon with Francis, not the official one, but I've, I trained quite a bit at extreme couture with Eric Nixick out there in Vegas. And he, he works with Francis. He's one of his head coaches <laughs> and I've gotten done a pad session with Eric. And then, you know, Francis comes in and he's work and just even being in there, you kind of have this feeling of like, man, I, we're cool. Right. Like, <laughs> and that super nice guy, Sc one of the scariest human beings on the planet, but, uh, Super, super nice guy. So uh, talk a little more about McGregor Poirier too during UFC 257, because I do think that although you were commentating, your case was uh, a little more rare than the rest of the commentary table. You know, everyone talked about the overall poise and the calf kicks from Dustin this time around compared to the first fight, uh, as well as the overall inactivity and possible change in stance from that karate style that we know McGregor so well for. Uh, as a top 10 guy in the division, that could fight one of, if not both of them in the near future. Did you see anything differently than what the average fan saw? I mean, I think a lot of people are kind of throwing McGregor under the bus with his, with his stance stuff. I think that narrative is a little bit, you know, they're stretching for that a little bit. I think he did get a little bit stiffer as the fight went on, but I think a lot of that had to do to the credit of Dustin for attacking that calf. And once that, I'm telling you, People don't understand. Oh, and the, the other thing is kind of people talking trash on McGregor. He can't even handle a kick. He's not a. It's a different ball game when that calf gets kicked. I've been hit by those same kicks from Hooker over over the course of five rounds, and I was hospitalized for two days because of that. And it's just like Poirier said, the compartment syndrome. That I I that's I had to stay in the hospital because they were thinking about slicing my calf open to relieve the pressure. So that's a real thing. Um, and I do think there was a lot of ring rust. I think that narrative really rings true. I think Connor just, you can't be hanging out on your yacht and living that, that sweet, comfy life and then step into an octagon with a, a hungry guy like Poirier who's looking to get a win back over you. Um, so if the trilogy does happen, I'd be curious to see the approach. I mean, Connor's already said there'll be no more Mr. Nice Guy. He won't come with that approach. And um, I don't know. But yeah, I mean, a lot of the things that people saw with the calf kick and him coming with a much more boxing style, I think if he knocked him out, though, we're not talking about that, right? We're right. talking about brilliant right. look. So everybody's always looking for, for something. But I think it just all comes down to Dustin having a really good game plan and staying confident. And once he tagged McGregor once, then I literally took my headset and I was like, I think he's got him. And then he heard him up against the fence because once I saw him smiling and pointing at Connor, I was like, now... He's getting in Connor's head. And once you can do that to Connor, Nate did it. Nate starts slapping him and pointing at him. And once you get him shooting, once you even get Connor even thinking about a shot, you've probably won the fight. Yeah. And it's it's so interesting to think about all of that, right? Because we've never really seen Connor face so much adversity, you know, until as of late, right? With Habib. Obviously, you know, not including Floyd, but that 10th round right after like the seventh round in that fight, Floyd started turning it on a little bit, kind of got yeah. a little more fatigue. Nate won, right? Even in Nate two, there was a window there. And, and Connor talked about it a few times throughout his uh, career where he was, he would have like a little pocket of, of exhaustion, yeah. right? And, it, and other fighters were taking advantage, whether it was Habib, Diaz, Poirier now, Right. But even in the first round, he looked good. His boxing yep. looked crisp and that boxing stance held up. He hit Poirier with some clean shots. Yeah, he cracked him quite a few times. That's the other thing. Somebody was there's a there's a few uh, 
Instagram pages I follow that are the the ones the Strangle Squad. Those guys are hilarious, and also uh, I think it's the MMA Casual Police where they they take stupid comments from dumb fans. Yeah. yeah. Somebody was talking about how Connor looked horrible. He didn't land any shots, and and the picture they put up was Poirier's whole face just getting smashed to the side with a left hand. I mean, I was there cage side. And a few of those left hands, we were like, oh, like that's going to be it. But at 155, Poirier just proved that with the muscle that he's put on, the size that he's put on, he can take those shots now. And I think that's also been Connor's problem is he was lacing people out at 145, but he hasn't really laced anybody out at 155 pounds. Now, granted, he had a picture perfect performance against Eddie Alvarez, but that was timing. That still wasn't necessarily like lights out shots. He right. had to drop him, what, three or four times. And I'm not saying Connor doesn't have dynamite in his left hand, but you talked about the adversity that he's been facing. And ever since moving up to 55 or 70, I mean, you know, he caught Cowboy, but that was kind of a, that was kind of a weird fight. That head kick, I think, wobbles a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you get kicked upside the jaw, you're going to get wobbled. Uh Sticking with some of the elites in the lightweight division, right? Charles Oliveira has been on a run since you beat him in 2017. And then considering a lot of people think that he's next in line for a title shot, I think that plays into you a a little more interesting than people give credit. Uh, How does that sit with you knowing that you're one of the only people to beat him or the only one to beat him since then? And do you think a win or two against some top 10 guys gets you a possible rematch with Charles belt or no belt on the line? Man, you know, full disclosure, I, I, I think I'm being very overlooked. You know, I, I think um, where I'm sitting in this division, I, I don't know what I'm doing next. I don't know who I'm fighting. They just knocked me down to 10, which, I mean, it's all understandable. Benil Dariush is on a crazy surge, but there's obviously Benil. I'd have to beat somebody like Benil or Diego Fieda or Ally Aquinta. And, you know, they're just not fights that really excite me. Things that excite me right now are getting up every day and training for this, this triathlon that I have coming up in, in March and, uh, and reading this script that I have um, from this guy, Rory, who's, who did the fight Island uh, declassified. He's mm. done some 30 for 30s. He's done a lot of stuff, really good director. um, And he's picked up this screenplay that he wants me to read. So until something exciting comes across the table, I'm, I'm just going to wait and see how the division plays out. And if that eventually works me out of the top 10 and I retire, then fine. But if they come at me with, Hey, so-and-so is hurt. I'm, I'm in shape all all year round now. So we'll see, but yeah, I really don't know, man. I, I, I've always said I want to only be fighting still at this point in my career if it means that I'm working my way towards that title shot. And that's why I'm not fighting right now, because I don't see those fights getting me to the title shot. Even though I beat Charles, he's a completely different fighter now. Right. But I'm so are you to be guys. Fair. I'm not one of those guys that's like, yeah, I, I beat that guy. It's like, yeah, I beat that guy how many years ago? Right. Uh, when you go into the, and first of all, I think you are also a completely different fighter than you were four years ago as well. One hundred percent. But when you go into these negotiations for your next fight, are there a minimum number of weeks that you're looking to train before you get back into the octagon, considering that RDA was such short notice? Yeah. So what that RDA fight did for me really was give me the confidence and uh, the reassurance to know that, you know, I don't have to do three months to get ready for a fight, especially nowadays. And leading up to that RDA fight, I was training for this race. So I was in really good shape, but I didn't step foot in an MMA gym. So what it teaches me is I got to kind of find a balance there. So if they give me enough time, I mean, realistically, four or five weeks would be great. Six weeks would be probably right. where If I had to pick, I would probably pick six weeks, five to six weeks is my training camps from now, whereas it used to be 10, 10 or eight. But I used to also be 198 pounds when I would start a training right. camp. And now at my heaviest, I'm maybe 182, 183, um, creeping down into the high 70s at some points. When I took the the fight against RDA, obviously I was, you know, no heavier than 180, maybe 181, um, which is still quite a lot of weight to cut in a week. But, uh, you know, in the past, I wouldn't have been able to take that opportunity because I would have been easily 
190 something. If not, if I had no fight booked on the horizon, I might be 200 pounds. Right. And so, yeah. So now I think uh, at least a month, depending on who it is that I'm fighting too. I mean, if it was, you know, if it's Conor McGregor, I'll take it on a day's notice <laughs> in a fight and I'm going to be making a ton of money. You know, you, you got to, you got to weigh your options. If it's, right. uh, you know, Diego Frejeda or Ally Quinta, give me some time. Let me set that up. I don't want to take that on short notice because if I lose that, then I'm for sure I'm done. And obviously Usman Burns is this weekend. You talk about the weight cut that you have to go through. Does anything at 170 intrigue you at the moment? Or do you plan on staying at 155? Well, I would stay at, I'm thinking 155, whereas most of my last year or two, it has been considering a move up. In fact, my manager, Brian, really, really pushed me. Duke Rufus really tried to push me to move up to 170 pounds, but that's all based on what I used to walk, what I was walking around at and how big I used to be. It's still my ideal weight class. I mean, that's still a weight cut for me right now. Like if you called me and said, Paul, we need you to fight in two weeks. I mean, I'm still doing somewhat of a weight cut to make 170 pounds, but in two weeks, I could also make 155 pounds now. Um, and I'm working with this the triathlon coach, David Tilbury Davis, who is really, really pushing me to get my weight even much lower than it is now, whether I fight or not fight, just whether you're racing or fighting, it's the less weight you can cut. I'm starting to really lean towards that you know so either a move to 170 or just stay lighter and and stay at 55 but there was for a while there i was strongly considering moving up to 170 pounds but there's just a few guys on that roster in the top 15 where i'm like i can't compete with the size of some of these guys I mean, right. Usman is humongous even gilbert burns who used to be a fucking lightweight is five or, not with yeah. him He's a big boy man <laughs> Some big boys in that in that division even masvidal was uh masvidal diaz they were both killing themselves to make 155 at one point as well yeah so i definitely want to switch gears a little bit uh something that a lot of people may not know about you is that you graduated from philadelphia's university of the arts uh you appeared in the likes of the eclectic society baggage uh it's always sunny in philadelphia so i'm going to read you a quick quote tell me if it sounds familiar to you it's from a 30 year old guy named tom uh, when I come home at night, I have to remind myself to kiss my wife before I say hello to Bowser. Does that ring a bell to you? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's got to be from Sylvia, right? Sylvia in 2011. Yep. Oh God. You know, that was at Act Two Playhouse. And yep. uh, it was a great theater to, to work for. Great people there. I loved the town that it was in. I think it was in Ambler, Pennsylvania. And there was a cool little restaurant down the street. But that play was, I hated doing that play and had nothing to do with the cast. It had nothing to do with the actual play itself, but I had to play three different people. That guy, that character who's obsessed with his dog. I had to play a woman, a, a middle-aged woman. And I had to play a androgynous, you didn't know what I was, psychiatrist, where I had this weird wig on and a, a suit, but you couldn't tell if it was a women's suit or a suit. <laughs> So it was a challenge for a guy like myself who was used to playing kind of the fringe characters of a play, you know, a little more on the, uh, you know, the tough guys and the, 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 the murderers or the, you know, the, the racist of a play. Like I was an eclectic society. I was Sean O'Day, who was like the kid from Boston who, who didn't want the young black kid in their fraternity. And so that one was like, oh, God, I shaved my legs for that one and everything. It was rough. So I know that you said that you're, you know, you're still getting stuff from people um, regarding acting. Would you consider kind of taking more of a, not a full-time route because you still have the commentary as well, but would you consider taking more of, you know, uh, more of a responsibility toward the acting industry uh, when you step away from the sport? It's 100% what I want to do. Um, I want to continue to do color commentary and desk work and, and, and broadcasting stuff with the UFC just because I, I enjoy it. I enjoy still being involved in the sport. I want to watch these guys when I do finally officially retire. I want to watch friends of mine as well, like Sean Brady, who's a Philadelphia guy. The Dawkins brothers are Philadelphia guys. My buddy, 
and really good friend Jared Gordon. I mean, Brendan Allen, the list goes on of guys that I train with. Bilal Muhammad, who's fighting this weekend. There's there's so many guys that I want to be a part of the rest of their journey. But yeah, I, I, that was a passion for years and years and years. I mean, I went to school for it. I'm just now finishing up paying off student loans for going to school there. So I, you know, my mom, it, w- it would definitely be really nice to put the fighting to bed someday and let my mom just kind of watch me act again, you know? So we'll see, but that, that is the goal. Yeah. So kind of relating that to your commentary, I mean, you've been a great addition to the table since joining a few years ago. How do you think your acting life played a role in your success on sports broadcasting's biggest stage uh, on ESPN? I think it was, without that, I don't think I would ever got that opportunity because I think just even the way I handled post-fight speeches and the way I was interviewed, having that that comfortability on camera, speaking to somebody, being present in the moment is all things that I learned in college. Um, and being, you know, just being able to express myself and, and and sound intelligent and not like some of these guys, you just see, they don't know what to do when the microphone's on them. And then obviously when that red light goes on on the camera, that's when it really, I got to take over. And the first few shows, I remember feeling really stiff. If I went back and watched the first few times I did the broadcast, I'd be like, Oh my God, that's not even me. But you start to find yourself in that role and, and acting definitely was a major part in me having that just relaxed, not stressing out and when things go wrong especially having the theater background goes wrong all the time chairs will break on stage a light might go out you know your your partner forgets their lines or an old person in the crowd's like what is he saying so you've got to be able to to go with things on the fly and we i've had crazy things on the broadcast where my earpiece is out the crowd is loud i can't actually hear what's going on but you've you've rehearsed it so you're gonna have to just go with it you can't stop in the middle of a live pay-per-view and be like i'm sorry i can't i can't hear anything so having that theater background for sure helped me with that and just kind of rolling with the punches and you talked about rehearsing uh do you think that overall like rehearsing scripts for the roles that you would play in those productions helped you in preparation for your broadcasts yeah and even the homework right um you know, sitting down with the the format scripts. I mean, it only took me a few shows to be able to realize, you know, okay, and and read these kind of elaborate formats that I wasn't used to. As you know, when you get a script as an actor, it's just it's their line, your line. There, you know, it's written like a play, but these formats are you know color coded and there's codes for things. And Paul will talk here, such as that, and they're just these grids. But having the background of being able to dissect the script and and, and go through rehearsals and figuring things out. I was able to follow along with those things. And now I feel completely comfortable with all that. And usually it takes us one time through, we'll do a rehearsal. And I, it's just like in acting, you know, you don't ever want to have a really good rehearsal right before you go live, right? So you almost purposely kind of phone it in. And uh, so that when the cameras are on, you know, all right, it's, it's real now. And that's something that I kind of bring to the UFC broadcast table that I definitely learned from acting. It's like that last one, you don't want it to be spot on. And then it's like, all right, cool. That was absolutely perfect. Now let's do it. Right. Oh, I just, that was the take. So I always learned to kind of save the good one for, for the moment. I got a few more I want to ask you. Uh, in terms of the preparation, do you think that you spend more time studying an individual fighter before a bout of your own? Or do you spend more time now studying someone when you're preparing to commentate and why? hundred percent when I'm commentating. Commentating. Um, I've got to be able to break them down personally for an audience to understand it in layman's terms, right? Whereas when I'm fighting a person, I can take a few looks at what they do and their tendencies, get it. I've probably seen them fight already, send it over to my coaches and they'll do the, the primary work on breaking them down and then structure my training around it. Whereas I can't do that. I can't send in my coaches to break it down. And then I got to call it on air. So especially for like main events, co-main events, when we do our um, um, keys to victory, or I have to, whenever you see a lot of the, the breakdowns that Cormier will do, where we're circling things, where we're explaining the B roll through certain stuff, 
right. that's either picked by us or our producers, but we have to go through it and talk about the points of what we're going to highlight, where the boxes go, where the arrows go and things like that. So it's much more involved when I'm breaking it down for a, for a fight. It's also sometimes it's hilarious when I when I see DC with the uh, with the marker on the TV and sometimes a line goes in a completely opposite direction or something yeah. like that. Yeah, he uh, he's better at that than me. That's why you always see DC on the telestrator. He enjoys it. Yeah, he enjoys it. He makes it fun for me. I'm just I get stressed out on the telestrator. Mm -hmm. And when he's on detail, too, I, I love watching him on detail. This most recent one of, of uh, McGregor Poirier, too. He breaks it down really well and talks about the first fight and includes it in the analysis. I think it's really good. Um, which discipline of martial arts do you credit the most to your development as a fighter, not only referring to your skill set, but also to your mindset uh, for the sport when you talk about it? Hmm. I mean, for me personally, <clears throat> it was, it was my karate and taekwondo background, right? It's kind of who I am as a martial artist and is where I come from in my roots. And that's kind of, that's why you see me handle myself the way I am, right? No matter what I see other people do and the success they get talking trash and being a little more vocal and disrespectful to their opponents, I just can't, I can't do it, right? Because the 12 year old me, Sal Sandone, my sensei, Master Chang, all these guys that, you know, developed me from 12 years old till I was in my 20s, basically, I can hear their voices in my head being like, that's, you don't need to do that to go fight. Right. And as far as when I'm breaking things down, I obviously come, uh, I mean, Muay Thai is my second biggest love in kickboxing. You know, right. I, I can really break down what they're doing in the clinch and even even when they're jockeying for position and against the fence, you know, I'm not much of a wrestler, but I, I, I succeed really well in those positions in fights. So I, I feel like my Muay Thai clinch and, and striking background is obviously what, what gets me through calling fights. Most of all. Last thing I want to ask you, uh, I feel like more people talk about two things, right? Legacy fights and money fights right. more than ever before. Right. Whereas, Earlier on in the sport, it was all about the gold. Right now, it's legacy fights and it's money fights because the sport has evolved. Uh, with Habib Nurmagomedov, it's George St. Pierre, right? That's like the only fight that'll get him out of bed to train now because it kind of seems like he's going to walk away from the, the lightweight strap. With Israel Adesanya, even though he just moved up to light heavyweight and he has a date booked with Jan Blachowicz, uh, it might be John Jones for that legacy fight. Right. So if you had to choose one dream fight from any era 155 170 who would you pick and why <laughs> good question sorry my daughter is playing with her ice cream thing um for 155 i guess it could be any weight class because when the ufc started there weren't any right I mean, I would have to go with, for 155 pounds, I mean, to be completely honest, I know he's about to walk away, but I think he's the greatest to do it at 155. It would have to be Habib. It'd be Habib? Go upstairs with your mom, please. I'm almost done. Go. I just want to hang out. I know you, you can hang out down here, but I'm doing an interview. Hey, don't Come. you go work or something? Yeah. So I would say he'll be, man. I mean, he's the guy or Connor, you know, if I'm going to have one last fight, if I had to pick one last fight, maybe McGregor, McGregor. you know, Irish American roots first, the true man. From <laughs> let's, let's go. We've had some words back and forth on, on Twitter and things like that. But I mean, he's, he is the fight, you know, you, you can't deny that. If you want to have the biggest fight of your life, you want to make the most money. So you got your money and your legacy all right there. You go out on your shield beating Conor McGregor. I mean, that that I would hang it up right then and there. I'd be like, peace. If I beat, beat Conor, I'd be like, I'm done. Back to then. Because then what can I do after that, right? right. You want to talk about getting back into act. You want to talk about getting back into the other ven ventures and, and, and capitalizing on the moment. Man, I'd capitalize on that so hard. I'd be in Hollywood the next day being like, all right, I just beat Conor McGregor. You guys probably know who I am now. I want to get back to acting. <laughs> It's the battle for the uh, the true Irishman, 
because yeah. I know he was calling he you out. Irishman, let's be honest. <laughs> I'm 